Hello, welcome to another toneless landscape oil painting demonstration. This is your painter in residence. I'm Francis McCarthy, and welcome as well to day 30 of the Past Masters series, volume 2. two, two, two. The uh, painting I'm bringing you today uh, was painted after George Ness. Uh, his painting was called Spirit of Autumn. I have no idea how big it is, but it's a pretty famous painting by him, late period stuff. Mine is 7 by 10 inches, so there you go. And actually, uh, currently, uh, we have like a, a studio holder show going on at the Quarry Art Center. This is hanging up on the wall there, but it's also going to my store, so stay tuned for that. And this is also the part of the video where, um, even though we're only less than a minute in, I will ask you to click the like button if you like the video, if you like my channel. Uh, if you don't like me, I understand that. But <clears throat> here we are, another day, another weekend, another past master. So I'm um, quite happy with the way this one turned out. And um, I have done it before. If you uh, actually, if you go to my channel, a lot of people aren't aware of this, but if you click on my actual channel, which you can get to by clicking on my name, um, there's a search feature there. You can type almost anything into that. And uh, like if you type in Spirit of Autumn, you'll see this one. And you'll also see the old 5x7 version, which I would have done four years ago. <laughs> Something like that. Uh, that was a 5x7 and um, also came out quite nice. Now, I'm hoping uh, all of the um, past masters that I've done any processing on are done you know. I have a few in the studio that are waiting for a second pass, but whether I can get the second pass on them and get them home, get them photographed um, in time for next weekend is debatable. I will say I, I might try, otherwise I might do what I did last time and just pull up maybe uh, a nice older one that uh, would have originally been broadcast at like 480 um, pixels per inch and um, because uh, my archive videos are, are much larger than that so I might do that I'm, I'm gonna gonna see no promises but I will I will have something for you no doubt uh, or I may just sub in um, an original painting of mine I've got a few good ones that uh, uh, it's always uh, juggling to, you know, I've got to uh, process the photography, I've got to process the videos, and then um, get them archived, and then I use the archive video course to create this. So, um, I've, I've read a lot about George Ness recently. Uh, he was probably the most popular painter in the United States at the time of his death, which was, say, I think it's 1892, but don't quote me, it could have been 1893. Uh, it was a, a quite an uphill battle for him though. There was large periods of time that he was not only not popular, but it's very hard for us as moderns to understand the importance of landscape painting in the 1800s because um, first of all, there was no color photography. Uh, there was not cheap color reproductions around. If you wanted a bit of color on the wall, it was an original painting. And people took painting and painters very seriously. It was a media. Like we have, you know, the internet today, or we have TV or movies. It was, you know, a media before other media, like movies. Books were around, and books were, I mean, that's really the... the, the golden age of the uh, literature would have been the 1800s. That's when... The, the literacy I know in the United States has never been higher than then. People knew how to read. People were reading for entertainment um, and of course for edification as well. But um, so criti critics, criticism and landscape painting and criticism of landscape painting was taken very seriously and given quite a lot of space in the newspapers of the day. And um, painters could be uh, Pretty, pretty close to celebrity status, you know. It, it may or may not be that they were recognized as they walked down the street, but, but certainly their names were known of the top painters. And George Ness was one of those, and he was very famous um, 
one of the reasons he was famous because he, he got a lot of um, he got a lot of trouble over the fact that he brought in the European influence to the American style and he merged them and uh, it was kind of a thing back then you know people had an attitude like American art for Americans you know you had the Hudson River School which was you know somewhat influenced by German school and other people like Claude Lorraine and, and people like that but but really uniquely American for sure um, and then when you introduce the Barbizon influence uh, which came online around 1850 uh, it was not really looked at uh, very nicely by um, the art establishment or the art critics and to Anessa's credit he stuck it out because he knew that the innovations that the Barbizon had made um, were absolutely critical and uh, were advancements in landscape painting they were not um, just some you know like it's again it's easy for us mo as moderns to forget this that art was still progressing at that point and it wasn't until moder modernism came along which in one sense was a creative force but in most most ways was a destructive force um, and and I would argue necessarily destructive to some degree however uh, what came out of that was people just thinking that uh, the, the whole art for art's sake this wasn't a thing in the uh, mid 1800s. This wasn't even a thing until the late 1800s, early 20th century. Century, art for art's sake, being an artist for an artist's sake, the whole bohemian thing th that we take for granted now that did not exist. A uh, a painter was somebody that produced paintings, <laughs> and people needed paintings. Usually, very wealthy people, um, because the common people. Um, you know really couldn't afford it so anyway uh, I didn't read out of a book but I gave you a little slice of life from back then and it's good to put these things in a context and I consider myself to be a post post postmodernist actually because my feeling is is that everything with art that can be done has been done um, there is really no new um, areas to go to so uh, so many of the things that were uh, just tossed aside in the uh, forward movement of art history um, some of those things that were tossed aside were intrinsically valuable in and of themselves things like a poetic approach to landscape painting for one I think that's um, valuable irregardless of the fact that it was popular 120 years ago that's sort of beside the point, really. Um, it's beside the point to me. It's not beside the point to art history, but let's face it, art history now is a joke. So um, the modernists came along, and then the postmodernists came along, and then the post postmodernists came along. And now, myself as a post post postmodernist, I consider myself to be a contemporary artist that basically can pick and choose from any mode. Of expression that um, has ever been done and uh, many of you uh, wouldn't be aware of this but I was a commercial illustrator I was a hired gun I could do almost any style I chose to do and I was paid good money to be that guy so um, when I came across tonalism and the poetic approach it completely resonated with me on a deep inner um, I don't like the word spiritual, but I don't have another word, so we we'll use it. You know, spiritual level, you know. Um, especially someone like Ines, he was really about uh, portraying the reality that is below the surface of um, our concrete reality. So the, the actual reality that supports the concrete reality, the spiritual reality. And that idea is what informs my work as well. And when I set out to do my originals, I don't sit down and go, oh, I'm going to try and paint this like an ass, or I'll try and paint this like Francis Murphy. Not at all. I just sit there and do my best to make a painting happen. And that painting is informed by the thousands of paintings I've done and the hundreds and hundreds of studies I've done at this point as well. Um, the reason I do the studies is so I can kind of pack in things like spirit of autumn into my subconscious and it's uh, 
um, not something I'll consciously pull up, but it informs my work on a subconscious uh, level, and it's super valuable. Nothing, I, and I've said this before, but nothing I've done has improved my work more. Now there was another thing I wanted to get into today, uh, maybe to kind of help you out. Maybe it'll help you out. Maybe it won't. I don't know, but you know me. I'm going to just keep talking until the end of the video, uh, either way. Um, but I was looking around for some reference. Now, I, I take my own photographic reference to base my paintings on. And by that, it's usually the fundamental composition of the painting. The trees, where they are in a landscape, things like that. <clears throat> I almost never use the sky that was in my original photo reference. I'll always reference another sky. Almost always. Not always. Almost always. And there's a lot of times where I may change uh, elements of the ground plane as well. Um, I might add a river or a road. Um, say we have a really awesome composition of some trees, but in front of them is a totally boring field of grass. Well, I might, I might try and find a way to interject um, some other elements into that, like a little stream or a little dirt road. Uh, you, you get the idea. Anyway, so that reference, uh, I do, I didn't collect, I do take pictures of things like streams and dirt roads, but I will also look around for things online uh, that I can maybe grab a stream here or a road there. And uh, so I'm looking at um, streams, rivers, and one thing I notice is that most of the uh, the reference I see out there has a super strong diagonal feeling to it and this is totally exacerbated by super wide angle lenses so and I've seen a ton of amateurs you know paint this stuff straight from the photo just the way it is in the photo <clears throat> you really don't have a choice if it's a strong diagonal it's a strong diagonal it's not much you can do with it <clears throat> except uh, what I would recommend which would be don't paint it. Just don't paint it. Don't paint strong, strong diagonals. Don't paint a road <coughs> that is covering the entire ground plane of your canvas with a strong diagonal formation or as a big tr strong triangle uh, shape that's on the ground plane that's a really elongated sort of shape. You don't want to do it because it looks terrible. And how do I know this? Because I tried to make it work so many times and I just know it doesn't work. The kind of roads that work are little wiggly roads, roads that kind of swoop around, that kind of thing. That works fine. Um, rivers, same thing. Actually, it's not a lot of difference. There's, uh, there are times where I might have a road in my reference and I turn it into a river or a stream. It's all, you know, part of the artistic license. But uh, now, and I kind of just breezed over this, but how do I know that this doesn't work? Um, because I could tell you, if you look in my old folders of streams and things I collected, you'll see tons of these strong diagonal things in there um, that I would never conceive of using now because I did use them. I did make all those bad paintings. I'm trying to help you out right now and tell you it doesn't work. Um, it doesn't work. Big strong diagonals anywhere in the painting, to be honest. In your clouds, um, in the ground plane especially. The ground plane would be the one place you could get away with it. Um, but watch out for these big triangles of a road. You know, if you got a road in perspective, you're standing in the middle of the road. It's just a big triangle in your painting. You can't fake it. You can't hide it. If you are going to try and make it work, you better make it organic. You better break up those straight edges. And that's really the kiss of death. If you are going to try and work in a long, long diagonal, um, the only way that you might be able to make it work is by... Um, modulating the edges, make, moving them around so they're not straight. Anyway, just a little tip from me to you. Uh, that was an insight I had last night while, like I said, looking for some little streams and things I could pop in the paintings. So hopefully that helps you out. Uh, like I said, it'll be in my store. Good price. Yeah. Or if you're in Fongare, come on down. Come on down uh, to the uh, show and see it. And um, also, again, if you haven't liked this video, smash that like button. If you don't like the video, please just go away. You, you, you went pretty far. <laughs> if, you're, if you're 
just now getting to the point where you go, oh, I, I don't like this video. Anyway, I'll be back real soon with another video. Meanwhile, do me a favor. Take good care of yourself, your family, your loved ones, even complete strangers. Why not? And stay out of trouble. <laughs>